Thank you for joining this fifth era webinar. Today, we're going to spend about 30 minutes talking about how you as an entrepreneur, which should put your best foot forward when you raise capital, especially in the early stage. Uh, this will be intended for entrepreneurs who are beginning to prepare for their presentations. And as a result, this is probably best to watch and listen to before you're actively pitching for your company. First, let me introduce who we are. We are Fifth Era, a, fam a family office based in Silicon Valley. Uh, Alison on the left has been here for 30 years and originally was a senior partner of large consulting firms, uh, AT Carney, where she ran the Global Financial Services Group before beginning uh, her period as the CFO and head of strategy for BGI, Barclays Global Investors, which is today part of BlackRock, the world's largest asset management company. Allison is also a public company board director, particularly in financial services. However, she's an early, st uh, early stage tech investor, particularly focused on fintech and blockchain. And she chairs the advisory board at Blockchain Capital. For my part, I too was a senior partner of large consulting firms running the West Coast for each of AT Kearney, Monitor and Booz and the global digital practice at Booz, which I co-led. I then became an early stage tech investor and first began with the Angels, uh, working closely with Band of Angels and helping uh, manage parts of Koretsu, which is today the world's most active early stage tech in investor. Uh, with about 55 locations around the world and backing close to 200 companies each year. Alison and I, as I mentioned, have our own family office. Uh, we also manage fund of fund vehicles, including Blockchain Co-Investors, which is the leading uh, fund of fund focused on early stage blockchain investing. And the rest of our team here are mostly Silicon Valley based and uh, help us enormously in this endeavor. So that's who we are. Most of the best practices that I'm gonna share with you today come from having watched hundreds and perhaps thousands of entrepreneurs pitch for money at Koretsu uh, in particular, but also at Band of Angels and in other settings. And it's my view that there are good practices that can be learned. Uh, but they're not widely spread. And the goal of this webinar is to share some of those perspectives with each of you. Uh, I also mentioned that we are active blockchain investors, which is less relevant for today. Uh, we, are, we use a fund to fund model there, so we do not typically do direct investing in blockchain. So there's no point pitching us. We primarily invest in venture capitalists. In order to get started, I should probably set the stage and I think most people are quite aware of this traditional view of uh, the venture ecosystem and the early stage investing ecosystem. And we have some notion that there's a series of stages and there's an expectation that companies will have gone through certain uh, milestones before they go to the next funding stage. Now, obviously this varies by industry and by technology, but this is sort of the generic view. There is an expectation that valuation will increase over time. And obviously from an entrepreneur's point of view, that's important to avoid dilution. And the investor expects that the failure, the likelihood of failure will decrease over time too. Historically, we began by believing that companies would pass through these types of sources of capital. So in the research phase, you're typically relying upon grants or other forms of non-dilutive financing that you can get because you have an interesting technology that is viewed worthy of some research grants and funding. And sometimes those are government, sometimes those come from academic institutions, and sometimes they come from companies or foundations or other sources. Almost always, there is some belief that the friends, founders, and family of a entrepreneur will help them and back them. And that's typically where the formation capital does indeed come. But quickly after that, individual angels and then angel networks and family offices will be funding most of the seed and oftentimes the bridge into and even the series A. 
and the venture capitalists are traditionally getting involved round about the Series A and are helping take the company through subsequent founding, found, uh, funding rounds through the mid stage and into the late stage. So this is the traditional view. Um, since 2008, we've seen the substantial rise of micro venture capital funds. The reason for this was that after the great financial crisis, the venture capital community changed substantially. The best funds raised a lot of capital and in some cases became, became multi-billion dollar mid and late stage investors and many of them retrenched from the early stage. Meanwhile, we also had a substantial shakeout of venture capital funds and many uh, new micro funds were created instead to fill the vacuum of the seed uh, stage, which most venture capitalists had abandoned. In parallel, we saw most large companies around the world becoming more interested in the external innovation ecosystem. And there are very few large companies that don't today have some sort of a venture investment program. And some of them, and many of them have captive venture capital firms. We also, over the last five to 10 years, have seen a global phenomena as a large number of incubators and accelerators have been created to help entrepreneurs uh, get started. And uh, frequently they are run by angel investors and scouted by angel investors. So incubators and accelerators can be a worthwhile place for a first time entrepreneur to learn and even for a serial entrepreneur to base their business. And of course, since the Jobs Act here in America and similar uh, regulation was introduced in Europe and elsewhere, we've seen the, uh, the rise of technology enabled early stage funding through crowdfunding platforms like AngelList or Cedars or others. Now in practice, uh, these, these, all of these are uh, the domain of early stage individual family office and venture investors. Uh, but there are another group of people that will provide capital in the late stage, which is not so relevant for today's webinar, but banks and companies will provide funding through a variety of means if a company gets to that expansion and late stage. Today, our focus is on the dark blue circles. Even though a lot can be said about incubators and accelerators and crowdfunding, the reality is the vast majority of early stage tech funding today comes from angels, family offices and the venture capital community. And that is where we'll focus the rest of this webinar. I'm going to emphasize 10 points today that I think are particularly important for an entrepreneur who wants to be successful in raising capital. The first is to recognize the reality that your capital is almost certainly going to come from angels and family offices, not from venture capital firms. And in fact, the way you go about uh, seeking out and uh, talking to angels and family offices can be quite different than the way you would speak to VCs. And I'll explain why. Secondly, uh, it's, it's very important that you understand why investors are interested or potentially interested in the business that you're telling them about and that you figure out how to help them accomplish their goals and objectives. In all of your pitches, it's going to be important that you focus on shifting their mindset from no, because the reality is most angels and most investors say no most of the time. And you need to ask them for small commitments. And we'll talk more about this uh, later on in this webinar. In particular, point five, you need to move them into some sort of a disciplined, organized due diligence process because they won't invest without passing through it. And you need to be very well prepared and very good at managing that process. And then we'll talk specifically in the next few points about how you do pitches. Uh, we don't want you telling linear stories. Uh, we want you to use a different approach, which we'll explain in point seven. And we always want you to be closing. And we'll talk more about that too. So first, in terms of who are you targeting? I think that there is a unfortunate 
uh, widespread belief amongst entrepreneurs that they will be able to raise venture capital dollars. And the reality is most of you will not. And that does not mean that you can't fund your company. It just means that you need to be clear that your target is very unlikely to be the VC community. The reason for this is that even though I just described the conventional wisdom, which is that you're going to pass through friends, family and founders capital, you're going to raise some angel capital, then some venture capital, and then you're going to drive for your exit. The truth is it doesn't work like that at all. In fact, there are two very different ecosystems for entrepreneurs to go out to raise capital for their startups, and they operate in completely different ways. The first is the angel ecosystem, which here in America backs more than 75,000 tech companies every year, which represents more than 85% of the funding rounds in North America. There it does begin with friends and family and founders, and you will need to raise capital from people you know. But then after then, it will all be about angels and to a lesser extent, family offices that may be interested in doing direct investing into tech companies. And almost certainly if you do get to an exit, it's going to be a corporate acquisition and it's going to be for less than $50 million. So it's going to be a modest size sale to a larger company. And because of that reality, the angel ecosystem is full of investors that want you to explain how you're going to build a company that someone else will want to buy. And that is a very different story than the venture capital ecosystem. The venture capital ecosystem backs uh, many fewer companies, about, they do about 10,000 rounds every year, but most of those rounds are follow-on rounds, and only perhaps 2,000 of them are first-time capital going in to new companies that they're backing for the first time. Here too, almost all venture capital funded companies have already been backed by angels and about 90% of the venture capital rounds will already have angels involved in those companies. The venture capitalists, unlike the angels, are professional investors managing funds of other people's money and they're looking to build the biggest companies and get to the biggest exits that they possibly can. However, the reality is those will still be corporate acquisitions. And even though we talk a lot about unicorns and IPOs, in practice, we only have about 650 unicorns in the world today, even though we back more than 80,000 technology companies every year in America alone. So in practice, even if you are raising capital from venture capitalists, you still need to worry about what are you building and why will someone else want to buy it from you? Uh, so this is a first choice. And I would argue that for almost all entrepreneurs listening to this webinar, you should focus on the angel ecosystem and get very good about presenting to individual investors and family offices. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't try and get a venture capital for fund to back you but the reality is the probabilities are very, make that very unlikely. Now, the second point is that you need to rep recognize that you are really trying to raise capital from someone else. And that even though you think it's about you, it's about your idea, the technology you want to use, the product you want to build, the customers you want to serve, in practice, the meeting you're about to have is really about the investor and you need to get on their side of the table very quickly. Who are they? Why are they investing at all in early stage technology? What are their goals for this type of investing? Do they have particular sectors or purposes and missions uh, that they are focused on? Uh, you can do a lot of good for yourself by doing a little bit of due diligence on the investors you're about to meet and make sure that your company is positioned in the context of what they care about. And I can't tell you how many times uh, uh, entrepreneurs will present to investors with no idea who they are or where they're coming from 
or what type of deals they're looking for, what sort of valuation parameters they may have, and, what's, and the reason why they're in the room at all. So this is a very important point. Do your, do your due diligence on your investors before you meet them and make sure you understand why they're investing and the, their typical patterns of behavior. The third point is that you need to understand that almost all investors enter the room expecting to say no. A typical angel investor will see hundreds of pitches every year, in some cases thousands, and in fa uh, whereas the average angel is probably only investing in three or four companies per year. So overwhelmingly, they are in the business of saying no. That makes the meeting very awkward for them because they don't want to disappoint you. They don't want to reject you. But the reality is they're almost certainly going to. And so their mindset is how are they going to say no? And your goal is to get them out of that mindset as quickly as possible. These are the top 10 reasons why uh, on, uh, investors do say no, and there's nothing particularly magical about this. They'll believe that your idea isn't big enough, your solution isn't good enough, no one's going to buy what you're building, it won't scale, it won't make money, uh, and you're, you won't be able to generate a viable company around your product or service. And then even if you do, larger companies or competitors will take your opportunity away from you and you won't be able to defend it. Perhaps they think your team and you are not good enough, or maybe they think you're great, but that your team is not complete enough and you don't have all of the people in order to get the task done. And then very importantly, if there's no exit for them, they're not going to make any money. So how will their investment be returned to them with a multiple of perhaps 10 times what they put in? Um, and will that return be big enough such that it justifies them taking the risk? So these are the 10 typical reasons for saying no. And this is what's filling their mind when you first sit down for them. Essentially, in the first minute or two, they're going to pick one or more of these and they're going to disengage from their conversation with you. And as we'll talk about later, this sets up the critical need for you to eliminate as many of these traditional objections as possible as quickly as possible. Fourthly, it's very important that you're clear about what you need to accomplish in the meeting. I see a lot of entrepreneurs who come to a meeting thinking that they're going to get a yes at the end of the meeting, that they're going to present and that the investor is going to lean over the table and say, yes, I want to invest in your company. That's too big a commitment to uh, expect. And in fact, the better the investor, the less likely they're going to do that because they haven't yet done their due diligence with you. And so what you need to focus on in every meeting you have are small commitments where you can move them from no to maybe. The most obvious commitments are things like, will you give me your card so that I can follow up if you're in a large group setting? Or will you sign up my due diligence sheet that I'm passing around so that I can inc include you in my for, uh, process? Or will you take a follow-up meeting? Or even will you refer me to someone else that may be interested so I can have a second meeting with someone else? Good entrepreneurs are focused on small commitments that move the investor into maybe, not yes. The biggest small commitment of all is the due diligence process. Uh, most investors, all family office, offices and all venture capital firms are not going to invest in you until they've completed their due diligence. And that may take weeks or even months of work. So it's critical that you focus in your meetings on moving them into due diligence, but it's also critical that you have prepared a good due diligence set of materials and that you understand the process of due diligence and what's going to be expected of you and your team and your advisors, your lawyers, your accountants, and so on. Now, at Kretsu, we've published for free 
a due diligence handbook, which you can find at the Apple Store. And we published it to help our own members. We have about 4,000 members today. It's grown greatly since we published this book. And those investors uh, need to understand what the due diligence process is. So we were looking to create a consistent, disciplined process of due diligence across all Koretsu chapters globally. But the advantage for you as an entrepreneur is if you read this book, it will help you get prepared as well. Uh, you shouldn't be intimidated. There is a lot. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're disciplined yourself, if you populate materials into folders and drop boxes or boxes uh, and share them and have them available, you'll be in much better condition once due diligence begins. And this is actually the last point I would make. It's too late when you're already presenting to raise capital for you to begin to think about due diligence because the process will begin too quickly there's too much work to be done and you will in practice have a bad due diligence process and therefore you won't raise money. So it's very important that you prepare yourself for due diligence before you start uh, pitching for capital. Now, I said at the outset that we don't believe in linear stories. Uh, unfortunately, this is the way we've all been taught to tell stories going all the way back to Aristotle and what we were taught at school. We were taught that we need to have a beginning, a middle and an end, and that there is some notion of establishing context and creating some excitement at the beginning. But then we go through all of the detail of our story and our sub story and the complications in the middle, and then we get to the answer. And the problem with this approach when you're raising capital is that you will already have lost the investors right at the beginning. I've already explained to you that they are in a mindset of no, and they're not going to wait 10, 15, 20 minutes for you to explain why they should pay attention. So in practice, they will, their attention will drift well before you get to some of the most important points about, about potential exits and potential returns and the like that you will have put at the end of your document. So what we recommend instead is that you do iterative storytelling. And in fact, you're going to tell your pitch even over the course of 10 minutes, at least three times. The most important is actually the first, the ramp. You're going to spend perhaps two minutes out of 10 telling them your story in a complete way. You're going to lead with your strengths. You're going to make sure that you include all of the key selling points and reasons to believe in what you and your team are doing. And you're most importantly of all going to preempt as many of their top 10 objections as possible, as quickly as possible. That's what you need to re rehearse more than anything. Because if you do a good job of the ramp in the first two minutes, you will have shifted them from a mindset of no to a mindset of maybe. They will lean in and they will say, oh my gosh, this company may not be one where my typical reasons for saying no apply. I really should pay more attention. And that's what you need. Because then in the body of your presentation, which we think should only be seven minutes or less, you're going to have 10 slides. You're going to keep it really simple. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. But you are going to cover off the 10 big points you need to cover off. And then in the closing, the final minute, you're going to say it all again. You're going to reset, restate your strengths. You're going to restate your key selling points. And you're going to ask them to accompany you into due diligence and you're going to drive them into that process by asking them to take small commitments to continue to participate with you. That is the way we want you to do it. It's highly iterative. You're making your whole story at least three times but it's the first two minutes that really matter. So I've already talked about the ramp enough. These were the 10 objections. Your goal is to try and have a story that explains your opportunity, the company you're building, and preemptively explains why these uh, objections don't apply.
And this is, I highly recommend that as an entrepreneur, you practice this time after time until you're very facile. It comes out very easily and it's something that is very natural to you. Now the body, um, I actually am a big believer in the work of Guy Kawasaki, uh, who many years ago now wrote The Art of the Start. So I'm not going to belabor this. In that book, he talks about the, his 10, 20, 30 concept, 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30 point font. We actually think 20 minutes is too long for angel and family office meetings, at least the first time you have them. Later on in due diligence, you'll have much longer meetings. Um, I think for venture capitalists, they do typically expect a longer meeting. These are the key points, but I won't go through them in detail today because I think Guy does a much better job of talking about what your 10 slides need to include. So please go and take a look at his work, which is also available online. And then the final section, what we call uh, the ABC, the always be closing, is that you need to bring the meeting to a close and invite them to continue to participate with you. So that's all I'm going to say today. I think it's fair to say that more than 90% of entrepreneurs do not do these 10 things that we have just discussed. And I think that if you do do these 10 things and you do them well, you will already be in the top 10% of entrepreneurs who are presenting to raise capital, at least from angels and families. And I do think conversely, that there is a different approach for venture capital fundraising, uh, which is not the purpose of this webinar, since uh, for most of you as entrepreneurs, uh, in fact, overwhelmingly 80 to 90% of you will not raise capital from VCs. So we encourage you to focus on your fundraising with angels and family officers. Alice and I have written about this topic elsewhere. These are three books that you can find everywhere. Amazon, Apple, Audible, Smashwords, paperback, hardback, ebook, and so on. Uh, it's the book on the left that as an entrepreneur, you might want to pick up. Uh, it talks bo both about the reality of angel and venture investing, but it also talks about the why now is a good time to be an entrepreneur. And we hope that you'll find that book of interest. And then if you do want to contact me, these are my personal contact details. I would say that for entrepreneurs, I'm much more likely to refer you into Koretsu. And in fact, Koretsu, which has 55 chapters around the world, is always very happy to have entrepreneurs as guests. So please go to koretsuforum.com, find your local chapter, reach out to the president or the entrepreneur director and ask if you can attend a meeting. Because the other thing that really helps good entrepreneurs get good at presenting is to watch other very good entrepreneurs doing a very good job of raising capital. And at Koretsu, we're lucky that we have a lot of returning uh, entrepreneurs who come back for additional money. So thank you very much for joining this webinar. We hope that this has been worthwhile. And with that, I will bring the webinar to a close.